Hey there, boys and girls. Tim K here, founder of the Veterans Project, to talk to you about this episode's sponsor, the Mississippi Coffee Lady, Joy Rogers. Joy is a good friend of mine and is the wife of a Marine Mustang who served in combat multiple times. Her passion for roasting is truly a beautiful portrait of the American dream. Now, she's born and raised around Starkville, Mississippi, and she started roasting some years back, experimenting with various beans from diverse origins and diligently studying the roasting process. Her work ethic is truly unmatched and is evident from the very first sip to the last drop in your mug. Excellence, I would say, would be the appropriate term. And guess what? Guess what? Red Fridays, the Mississippi Coffee Lady pledges every single penny, single penny, to sponsoring the podcast. That's right. Every bag you buy, every single time you subscribe to her coffee subscription service, all those funds go directly towards the capturing of our legacies. She truly puts her money where her mouth is in backing this work. Now, I could speak to you for days about Joy and what an incredible patriot she is. I know her well. She produces an incredible product, and she loves our troops. Hey, that's a win-win for all you followers and listeners out there. Head over to MississippiCoffeeLady.us. Even the end of the website is US, so you know it's good. To purchase a bag or two, or get on the subscription list where you're guaranteed her freshest roast every couple weeks. And trust me, it is fresh. Check it out. Our next guest on the podcast is an incredible friend of mine, an amazing human being, undeniably strong woman. Sherry Regalado is a gold star wife who lost her husband tragically to an insider attack in Mosul in 2008, a city which most would know as being one of the most dangerous in Iraq, an almost unconquerable territory that left many American soldiers wounded or dead. Sherry's words are undeniably strong. Her strength is absolutely incredible. And her resolve is something that is almost non-quantifiable. But let's let her take it from here and tell you the story of not only her life, but Jose's. There she is, the one and only Sherry Regalado. The Veterans Project is a comprehensive essay capturing the legacies of our warfighters, caregivers, and civilians who have stepped forward in defense of our patriotic principles in an effort to capture their stories and to never forget the staggering sacrifices of our nation's finest. This is the Veterans Project Podcast, where our legacies are the mission. Here's your host, Tim Kay. Welcome to the Veterans Project Podcast. My name is Tim Kay, and I will be your host, as always. Today, we have a very, 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 very... <laughs> she's smiling at me right now. <laughs> very special guest. I want you guys to really listen in close, because this is such a powerful story, but Sherry has this positivity to her that you'll be able to hear on the mic um, as she, you know talks about some of the things that she's going to talk about transitioning and dealing with that death at a very young age. So Sherry, uh, thanks for being with me. Thanks for coming on the Veterans Project podcast. You're the first one, first caregiver. We're very glad to have you here. Well, thank you for having me, Tim. I am always more than happy to not only share my time with hanging out with you, but also, of course, being able to share with others who don't really know what we as the families go through, not only during the war, having our loved ones away, but knowing what it's like to understand that our loved one is never coming back home. Yeah, I mean, that uh, right there, it's almost uncomfortable uh, for us guys. I know that that's why I stayed away from the caregiver side for so long. Um, I was really worried about showing the proper respect uh, but jumping back into that is very uncomfortable for us guys, you know, like willingly walking back into that world right. like, oh, hey, this is awkward. Um, you know, my buddy got killed or something like that happened or my buddy killed himself or, you know, he lost him tragically. And then, you know, 
it's nice to be able to step outside of that and like just every once in a while send a, you know, a nice little note to the wife or something, but it's hard to jump back into that world and really show care because that puts us in an emotionally vulnerable place and we don't like showing emotional <laughs> vulnerability. I mean, I do, but <laughs> most people don't. So, um, you know, for me, like your story is so impactful, but Sherry, I'd love for you to take us back, um, to your youth and growing up. I know kind of a sore point <laughs> sometimes, but you're very open about it. You know, you grew up in Idaho, right? Uh, I grew up a, a little bit of everywhere. I was born in Dallas, Texas. And then when I was about two years old, we moved to Boise, Idaho. And it was my mom, my dad, and my three sisters. And from there, we, we kind of bounced around a little bit of everywhere um, between one trailer to the next. And we... We were what people would typically call white trailer trash. And it's not something that I understood as a kid. I I was way too young for it. But I can look back and and recognize that that's probably what we were seen as. And I, I pretty much have limited memories during that time. But those memories that I do have were far from being great memories we were, my sister and I were bounced around from one house to the next, and it was pretty much initiated because my mom went to prison when I was, I want to say, two or three years old, and... Um, <laughs> you, you can't mean- just say that and then, like, <laughs> not talk. I listen, so we've had her on the Caregiver Project, obviously, but for some of you that are going to be listening to this podcast, it's going to be a whole new thing, so tell us about mom going to prison you mean not all moms go to prison when you're three (laughs) i I mean if my mom went i don't remember but i'm pretty (laughs) sure she did not but that that's that's wild tell tell us about that uh so when i was three my my dad was a very abusive man and my mom kind of put up with it and it was just something that she was used to from her childhood she grew up in a household where Women were not seen as anything more than a person who cleans up and has children. And so when my mom was growing up and not experiencing an actual loving household, she didn't go into a marriage that was loving and respectful. And so when my when my dad started beating her, it was just another thing that women had to deal with. And he ended up. Uh, pushing her down a flight of stairs. She miscarried a baby that she had. And my mom decided that that was pretty much it. She decided to leave my dad. And it was like a back and forth thing. She came back. She would leave. She got pregnant with me. She had me. And so when I was about three, my mom found another man that she started dating. And he committed a crime. He decided to steal a car, had my mom in the car with him, crashed it, and told my mom well, if you take the rap for it, you'll only get about three to four years or three to four months. I'll get time because I have priors. So of course, my mom being young and dumb, she took the rap for it and she ended up getting four years in Boise State Penitentiary. Uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> I've heard this story before, but it blows me away every time. So mom goes to prison. And mom goes away for a little while. She doesn't go away for three or four months. She goes away for three or four years. Yes. And those were formative years in your life, right? I mean, how old were you at the time that she went? I want to say three, three or four. Um, It would have to have been about three years old. Okay. So she got out when you were how old? About six, seven? No. Well, I didn't actually meet her until I was eight or nine. Oh, wow. So what happened to you when she went to prison? I lived with my dad for a little while, and he just did not know how to take care of two daughters on his own, and we went to school dirty, and when we did go to school, it was once every other week or so. I looked at my transcripts for kindergarten, and I went 55 days total out of an entire school year, so I had to do kindergarten again. Oh my gosh. And since my dad didn't know what to do, he kind of passed us on to one of his sisters. She couldn't afford two extra kids, so they passed us on to her other sister, which then we got passed on to my dad's mom, so my grandma. And at one point, she just, she couldn't have us again and passed us on to another aunt who decided she couldn't afford us anymore. And so she called my aunt in California and said, you need to come get these girls. 
and they packed up all of my belongings into a black trash bag Mm -hmm. and pretty much just put us into my other aunt who we had never met into her white van and sent us on our way. Wow. So let me paint the picture for those of you who just heard and Sherry painted it very well herself, but you're three years old mom gets pushed down a flight of stairs by dad has a miscarriage imagine growing up this way for a second i want you to visualize this as you're listening don't visualize it too hard because it's pretty depressing (laughs) but you're in that position and then mom goes to prison and then you were bounced around from family to family basically as a means to be funded for those families. They're seeing you as like basically a welfare check in a way. Exactly. Which is despicable and disgusting. And for those of you, you know, who are listening, who can, you know, experience domestic abuse in the household, and, you know, this is probably a hard one to listen to, but it's needed because I want you to see Sherry's life as it was uh, growing up and all the hardships she endured before she even got to the point where she could, you know, lose her husband in combat. And that that part of that picture prepared her, though, in a way, for that, that level of pain. I mean, nothing can completely get you ready for that, but you would experience pain your whole life. Right, and there's there's two things that I kind of learned from it, and it's that the entire lack of self-confidence and self-esteem that I had stemmed so much from being a kid that was bounced from one house to the next because it was, am I not deserving of being in a loving home? And am I not deserving of having something to call my own, like my own bedroom, my own home? And so it kind of set the plans of not feeling worthy of having someone to genuinely love me. I can imagine. I mean, I I can't because I didn't experience that, but I can only imagine that that's what that would lead to. I mean, you being passed around like that, I mean, that's just horrifying, quite honestly. But, you know, Sherry, one of the things that amazes me about you, and we've had so many discussions about this over the past couple of years now that we've known each other, but your perseverance through that. And you almost not even seeing that as a thing. You're like, well, that's just what you do. You know, you just get passed around and, you know, and your parents you move on. throw you around and you move on and, you know, your husband gets killed in combat and then you move on. It's like, hey, man, these things don't usually happen. But they, I think, you know, that kind of domestic pain in the family, that does happen more often than we see. Right. It is a bigger problem than we often know about. You know, even I think there's a lot of covering that up, especially in the past where you could kind of roll that up under the carpet. You know, nowadays it's a little harder to get away with those things but you on a very real level your whole life were being passed around talk about the um that time when you finally do reach you know age 17 18 and then you met someone pretty special so when i was 17 18 i was you know freshly out of high school and during that time I was already dating somebody. I had been dating him for a year and it was pretty much on and off. And one day my sister came home and she had been talking to somebody who was deployed in Iraq at the time. And she was telling me, you know, this is a guy from high school. I think you remember him. And she said, but I'm talking to him again. And this is who it is. And just... I came home again, uh, maybe like a week later, and she had flowers waiting for her that were uh, hangover flowers. We had (laughs) we had been to a party um, a couple nights before, and she was wasted. And he said, "Hey, like I hope you're feeling great. Here's some beautiful flowers." And I jokingly told her, "Oh my God, does this man have a brother?" (laughs) (laughs) Surprise! She she said, "Yeah, he does. Um, Here's his phone number. Please don't fess up." (laughs) Mm. (laughs) And so, what did I do? I Mm. called him, and the second I heard his voice, I peeked over to my sister and I said, "Oh my God, I'm going to marry this man." Wow! And he was telling me that he was stationed at Fort Knox, Kentucky. And for me, I 
I must have been dumb as could be because I could not point Kentucky off on a map. <laughs> <laughs> but I was I was just so in awe of how he spoke about the military and he just told me, yep, I'm I'm a Cav Scout. I'm stationed at Fort Knox and, and that was it. From there on out, we would talk to each other four to five hours a day, sometimes even longer till... You know, he had to get up for PT in the morning and he tell me, I have to get 30 minutes of sleep. I've got to go. Mm -hmm. And that pretty much kicked everything off. That one phone call to where that was, I want to say in like June 2006. Mm -hmm. And by October, he had called me at 10 o'clock in the evening and said, hey, I bought you a one-way ticket to Louisville. You're either on it or you're not. I'll see you then. Mm, wow yeah that that was it like i had one night to pack my bags and i had never flown anywhere so i was just like oh my do i take my books with me what do i pack what is, i don't is it cold in kentucky like, <laughs> what do they have there do they <laughs> i i was so a walmart <laughs> I, and it's funny because they barely had a walmart <laughs> I, i've been to kentucky yeah, no offense no offense but some parts, I could totally believe them not even having a Walmart. Yeah, and I loved it. I I had grown up in Kentucky or in California, so moving to Kentucky was it felt like a complete culture shock. <laughs> right, I can imagine. Yeah, it was a culture shock coming from Texas for me. And yeah, they're both pretty similar states, kind of in a lot yeah. of ways. Yeah, still the South, you know. That so, I mean. You know, you talk about Jose with so, such love, you know, I immediately see you beaming smile, you know, because you obviously have some incredible memories, you know, do you remember those phone calls really well? I mean, you know, you spent four five, six hours with him on the phone. I mean, you must remember those pretty well. Oh, it was, there's a lot of things that like memory wise, I kind of gloss over, but those phone calls for me, because we spent so much time together and there was... A lot that was shared over it and it was a lot about talking about my mom because for him he grew up in a tight-knit family to where for them they family was absolutely everything he was one of five kids mm -hmm. and so for him family especially a family a hispanic family from mexico it was just a completely tight-knit family so for him he wanted to know about my mom and my sisters and just my life in general and so being able to share things that I really had never shared with anybody else was a pretty big change because up until then, it was something that I would kind of quietly laugh about like, haha, my mom is crazy <laughs> without people actually understanding that my mom is legitimately crazy it's and -blown crazy. just everything that I had to experience to get me to the point that I'm at now to where I can laugh about it. But he was the first one that I really fully shared what my life had been like yeah wow that's powerful um you know I, I remember when i was covering you for the caregiver project and you know going through his box of things and just impacted by the letters and seeing all the love there um in that box was really powerful for me because it made me think of my buddies you know it made me think of guys that i know who hadn't who never you know came home yeah and not seeing the other side of things, right? I don't see their wife crying over those letters and I don't see, you know, the moms, you know, suffering through those things. But then through the caregiver project, I've seen a lot of that and I've seen, you know, we shed some very real tears, you know, and that would probably me more than you, but <laughs> 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 hey guys, that's me. I'm a crier. Um, <laughs> Don't tell my unit. Uh, they won't listen to this podcast anyways. But, you know, there, there were moments there where I was just so impacted by his legacy. Um, you know, made me wish that I had known him, you know, because it was like, gosh, I would have loved this guy. Like, or I would have not gone along with him at all. I would have probably loved this dude, you know. Like, he seemed like a very headstrong individual. Oh, he, he was almost to a fault. Yeah. And we had quite a few arguments because of it because for me i am i am very just free and You're wild free, what? wild spirited and for him <laughs> it was very like strict this is what we do this is why we do it what the hell are you doing right now and i for me it's very like spacey and add and for him it was it made no sense like hey this is not how the military runs this is not how our house is gonna run yeah yeah <laughs> so, so there was like a slight clash but that's what made it so fun because we'd be like hey no jose we gotta have fun today it is saturday you have nothing to do today but mm. then it was like no i have to make sure my guys are okay let's 
we, there is no break for me. I, I'm a calf scout. <laughs> <laughs> Scouts out. Yeah, he was proud, though. I mean, that's powerful. Uh, he, he loved the United States Army. And, man, I love some guys that love the Army because I get to hear about the Marine Corps all the time. But I but, love some guys that love the Army. I mean, he would tell me, I think within the first conversations it was just so you know the army comes before you so that was that was like a really hard thing to hear but then i i saw just how much he cared about his guys to where it was just like i get it like you guys have to trust each other with your literal lives so like i get why your military career comes over me because either way i'm gonna be safe i am home i am tucked away cooking dinner for you every night you have guys that rely on you. Yeah. And so I saw so much more of it when he actually deployed. And it was just, I get it. You were preparing for this. These guys have to trust you. So you know what? The reason why these guys were coming over for dinner with us was because they didn't have a family to sit with. And that's what you wanted to do. You wanted to give that to them. So when you guys did eventually deploy, there was this sense of comfort already there and trust. So mm. I, I totally understood it. It just took me a little bit to get out of my own personal little bubble of being 19 years old, understanding that someone's telling me, well, you know what? I love you, but this comes before you do. Mm, yeah. I want to spend my life with you, but. <laughs> yeah, I know, but. Big but. Yeah. But I also want to spend my life with the army. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> First. <laughs> First. <laughs> You're second. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but it's very hard. Like, it's very hard for a lot of people to accept that. A lot of wives, uh, a lot of husbands, you know, who are in that role, you know, kind of see the army. You really, when you marry into that, you have to realize, like, in order for them to be really good at what they are, that's almost has to come first. Right, and it, it is literally a life or death experience that they're having and so if they're not mentally fully in it and if they have a wife who's just constantly nagging about it it's it's so hard to mentally be in a place to be able to make sure that your guys are taken care of and that's why i think it's so hard for a lot of military spouses to understand why they have to actually put the military first and i'm not saying that has to be like the one thing and it's, it's just way above your spouse because that's not what it is it's very much a give take but lives depend on that sort of trust right absolutely so talk a little bit about the wedding day because this one's kind of cute <laughs> i love it actually i love that story because it, it was so like kind of impromptu right oh it, it, it was completely impromptu i wish i was wearing different clothes <laughs> <laughs> yeah what were you wearing again like a hurley sweatshirt or something a volcom or i was wearing a uh, white capri shorts that <laughs> were terribly ill-fitting that had been to way too many high school parties mm -hmm. um a black volcom sweater and a <laughs> polka dot headband <laughs> 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 I was 19 and should not have been wearing that. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody should be wearing that. <laughs> no, nobody. <laughs> nobody. <laughs> so, so how did that happen? So we, we were at one of the graduations at Fort Knox and I was part of the FRG, which meant I was inside selling t-shirts and sweaters to all the moms dads grandpas that were coming in to see the graduation yeah that's family readiness group right yes the family yeah. readiness group who pretty much just helps the families out through not only just appointments but like if your husband is in the field well this is who you have to contact if you need a little bit of help sometimes if you need like fin financial assistance they'll point you in the direction to go so it's just a place to go when you don't know where to go right yeah and Makes so sense. we were we were selling little trinkets and sweaters and it started pouring outside and jose had told me after the graduation he was just like hey you want to go get married <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, that's you know. a usual question like, after FRG meetings. Yes. <laughs> well, and if you have any experience with the military, that's how everybody gets married. That is actually it. And then 99% are divorced within like two weeks. <laughs> honey, honey, that was a great dinner. You want to go get married? Yeah. <laughs> but we don't even know each other. Hey, honey, matter. I know we just met, but do you want to go get married? <laughs> BAH, baby. I have TRICARE I can offer. I got TRICARE, and... <laughs> baby. Gosh, that's hot. <laughs> Say it to me slower <laughs> <laughs> this podcast com soon becomes x-rated <laughs> we're gonna have to put the explicit mark on this one <laughs> so so you do you get married 
Well, and and the story of it is even funnier. Once we got to the courthouse, I had never been married. Jose had actually been married and had only been divorced legally for about uh, four or five months. Wow. And it, it was just a weird situation. But anyways, we get to the courthouse and we're like, hey, like we want to get married. What do we do? Well, you need at least two witnesses and then you guys can get married. But so-and-so isn't going to be here until like four o'clock. So find your witnesses and then you can get married. And Did you so, just like grab random bystanders? <laughs> I We were both texting people just like, hey, we're going to get married. Do you guys want to come to the courthouse? And they're like, well, we're still at the graduation. We technically can't. Why are you at the courthouse? <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to be there. <laughs> and so it was just a struggle trying to find anybody. And one of my, my friends, Stephanie... Her then husband was in Jose's unit and she was just like, hey, I can be there. I'll I'll be there in like 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Can I bring my sister? Like, well, can she be a witness? I've never met her before, but can she be a witness? Because we don't have anybody else. Mm, That's a wing woman if I ever Oh, it it was great. It was fantastic. It was like, hey, nice to meet you. Um, Can you sign my marriage certificate? (laughs) (laughs) And it's funny because like I'm I'm still friends with her and her sister. We have her on all of our. I mean, you have to stay friends with that person, (laughs) right? Seriously, that's a rule. And it was the only time I had actually ever met her sister, and we're on each other's social media and everything. And every now and again, she'd be like, "Hey, remember that time I was at your wedding?" (laughs) (laughs) You're like, "Yes, I do." (laughs) Thank you, fist bump. So yeah, it was it was like a huge deal for us because if they hadn't come in we probably wouldn't have gotten married that day and who who knows if how long it would have taken for us to actually get married and we were already telling each other like oh this is my husband this is my wife yeah. after even like a month of me moving out there wow. and the funny thing is is like when i had moved out to kentucky i had never met jose in person so it was like a god i hope we like each other in person wow <laughs> I don't think I knew that part. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. So you're meeting in person for the first time. And yeah. Like, yeah. It was like a long distance Tinder before Tinder even happened. <laughs> Nobody knows what Tinder is on this podcast. Yes, everybody is. Yeah. Funny story about Tinder. Yeah. <laughs> How I met my husband uh, now. Also her husband now. <laughs> this gets better and better. Every time you tell the story, it changes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. She told me that in the beginning. But that's that. So you get married. What was it like after that? I mean, so Jose had been deployed before to Iraq. Yeah, and he had he, lost some guys. Like yeah, he had seen some action for sure. Yeah, he had deployed to Taji, Iraq, when he was eighteen. He mm. had signed up because of nine eleven, and for him, it was just something that had had impacted him so much that even though he was too young at the time of nine eleven, he said. I have to fight for my country. This is something that I have to do. And he grew up in El Sereno, California, which anybody who knows of El Sereno, California, understands that you either get out and do something better for yourself or you stay in and you end up in a gang. And Mm. that was something Jose always said he was not going to do. He wanted to do better for his future children. And so Mm. he knew that to do that, he had to get out. And one of the best ways to get out was through the military. Mm. And so for him, it was love of country and understanding that he wanted to be better than what he possibly would have been if he stayed. You know, and that's one thing amongst the guys that inspires me the most. Uh, Guys that do that. I had a guy in my unit who had, you know, been in some Houston gangs and had, you know, run into some big trouble. And he had joined, you know, because he wanted a better life. He wanted to better himself. That soldier, that Marine, that, you know, airman, sailor. Let's just keep it a soldier and Marine because those are my favorites. But <laughs> <laughs> Mine too. I'm already losing <laughs> listeners as I talk. Um, but, you know, I, I have a bias, obviously, being Army and serving an infantry unit. And um, those guys are the guys that inspire me the most, the guys who join for that, because I don't know what that's like. Right. I grew up in the suburbs. I grew up to parent. My dad had a really tough life growing up, you know, kind of growing up around South Chicago. My mom had a good life and I had always grown up with respect for the military, but I never really wanted to join. I mean, to be honest, I joined for college and a lot of the guys in my unit who would join for like the purpose of like bettering themselves. Mm -hmm. Man, salute to those dudes because I 
didn't, I had no concept of that, you know, like I, for them doing that, like was so brave to me and so sacrificial. The fact that they wanted to get out and make themselves better was just inspiring. So Jose, you know, is very much an inspiration to me, even though I don't know him, you know, you telling me a story again and again and again, you know, every time we talk, I think I ask you another question about him yeah. you know, because he does inspire me and his legacy lives on. Um, you know, because of the man that he was wanting to join for that purpose is so powerful to me. Right. His thing he always said, and I actually have it in a letter where he said, like, I, I am fighting for the American dream, no matter what that American dream is for each individual person. I am fighting so that everybody can keep the idea of the all American dream. And for him, it was, I want to one day have you know, a couple of acres with a white picket fence to where I can be sitting in my rocking chair with my dog by my side and my rifle. Yeah. <laughs> and for him, that's that, how I picture him. Yeah. That was like his all American dream. So, that's so he was he, a retired guy. Like he was definitely going to stay in. Oh, 100%. That yeah. was, that is what he lived for. There were times where his dad would kind of get in his ear and he'd be like, Hey, Miho, you have to get out. This is not the kind of life that you want to have. Like, let's start a restaurant. You can be in my flooring business with me and Jose would he'd entertain it every now and again but deep in his heart it was I, I want to fight for my country mm. and his big thing actually was I, I don't want to die an old man I want to die fighting for my country that was that's what he would say from the wow. very beginning and so and I'd you say, married that guy. and I would tell, <laughs> and I, I would tell him I'd be like you know cool before the, the, you married me you you mean you know you want to fight for your country and then die an old man who dreams that he's fighting for his country like no. but for him it was just no i i'm gonna i want to die and his thing was like i want to die in like the throes of battle and it's going to be like this this heated moment and mm -hmm. and so like when we kind of look back at how it happened there was a time where i was just like oh Jose might be a little disappointed that this is how he died, but then you just kind of have to step back and and recognize that he he was fighting for a country that he absolutely loved, and so for him, however it happened, like he would be so proud that that's just how he died that that he was he was doing what he absolutely loved for the country he loved. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, you know, a, a true Captain America, uh, somebody who really believes in the purpose and the mission. Because I know a lot of times I was like, yeah, this sucks. Like, this is so dumb. <laughs> you know, like, and, 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 and that happens, I'm sure, within, like, you know, what he was doing. But he believed so strongly in the purpose and the mission. See, but the funny thing is, though, like, no matter how bad it got, there was never a time where he was like, fuck, this is hard. Like, I hate this. It was just... Hey, we keep going, guys. Mm. Like, suck it up. This is what we do. And his thing always was, we're Cav Scouts. This is what we do. People don't understand. This is what we do. We that's keep cool. going. Wow, that's cool. And so no matter, like, even if they were in the field for two weeks, it was just, no, guy, like, suck it up. We're in the mm. field. Like, you have to prepare for, like, us actually going to war. So for him, it was, it was never like, God, this sucks. It was just, we do what we got to do. And part of the pain and the suffering of that first appointment certainly you know, followed him, right? You yeah. You talked about that. Like you could kind of see it in his eyes, like that purpose. Oh, for sure. Especially because he was so young when he deployed and losing so many of his friends during that time that being or knowing that he could possibly go to war again after knowing what it was already like to experience it at such a, at such a young age, it was just, God, he's just like, this isn't something that we joke about. This is a real thing. And... It forced him to grow up really quick. And when I first met him, it was pretty early on that I was able to recognize that he very much had post-traumatic stress to where I would wake up in the middle of the night and he would be low crawling through our living room. And I had woke him up one day or one night and he completely freaked out. Like I almost thought he was going to attack me and then I had to like shake him to wake him up and he wow. had no idea what was actually happening. And so mm. he finally decided at one point that, you know what, I think I need to see somebody. Mm -hmm. And for Jose to do that was a really big deal, but he was able to recognize that I have demons that I need to talk about. I need to be able to do something about it. Mm. And what happened? Well, they tried to medicate him. Mm. And he wasn't the, having any of that, was and, he? Oh no, mm. absolutely not. The man barely took Tylenol and he kind of recognized that 
I'm not the same person. I can't lead the same way when I'm on these medications. They make me tired. And you know what? They make my nightmares worse. And mm. so he stopped taking it. And it was it was something that he didn't like to admit that it was that war was something that affected him so heavily, but it also made him a better leader for new guys who were coming in to where he could tell them, this is what it's like and we need to prepare you. So it, it was kind of like a double-edged sword for him to where it was, this is going to make me a better leader, but at what cost when these are the demons that I'm fighting? Right. That's powerful. Um Every time, I mean, every time you tell me more about him, you know, and I, I always learn something, but it's like, gosh, oh, this guy is like a stud. Yeah, like, especially for being so young, too. Yeah. Like, you see how much our guys are going through, and they're 19, 20, 21, and like their lives are barely starting as adults, and they're already experiencing something so horrific as war, especially, you know, in Mosul in 2008 when it yeah, was such terrible. a hot spot. It, yeah. it was it was pretty brutal. And to put a 22-year-old man out there who had already been experiencing it since he was 18 is is so insane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean it's it's amazing, and and the uh, for those of you that are listening that kind of don't understand the dynamics of Mosul, Mosul was always a hotbed of insurgency. Uh, pretty much, you know, I'm sure there are some historians who are going to listen to this and be like, "That's not right, Tim. Um, <laughs> you're wrong about that." Oh, you know, pull out the Google and you know, let me correct you. <laughs> as I start googling right now, as I start, <laughs> this is not right. <laughs> but there were a lot of bridges into Mosul. Uh, Mosul was a massive city in northern Iraq, and so and it's closer. To, it's kind of close to some borders too up there. So there's this problem of having foreign fighters constantly coming in. And I think the Chechens were really big trouble out there, and some other um, sex, sects uh, and tribes. And so there was a lot of civil war on top of all the other things that were going on. Uh, but it was just a hotbed, and it was an area that, unlike Fallujah and Ramadi, which we actually did, you know, we're able to kind of solve the problems there. Mosul was just like a ne- an area we never quite got a hold of. Like, it was always a hotbed. We never really took it. I mean, when I was there in like 08, 09 time frame, we were talking about making a final push up there. Yeah. I mean, it was not conquered. They could, we had not fixed the problem, and we were getting ready to pull out. You know, it's like, so that, I mean, you constantly heard about 4th ID guys and guys in the units up there in Mosul, like the units that, you know, um, Jose was with, constantly getting killed and getting hurt. Yeah. And sniper teams going out there and just being like, like, dude, that place is a wild west. That place sucks. Like, well, and it was brutal when when we actually pulled out of Mosul in what, like January, February of two thousand nine. Mm-hmm. It was one of those moments where it was just like, would would my husband still be here if we had pulled out just a little bit earlier? Right. And so when I saw that, I remember I mean, that it, has to cross through your mind. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember seeing it on the news, and that that is actually one of those moments that are really vivid to where it was just like oh my God, if only this would have happened a couple of months earlier, my husband might be home right now. Yeah. And so I was I was thrilled for the guys who were able to say like, oh, hey guys, we're pulling out of Mosul. We don't have to go back there right now. Yeah. And, <laughs> we and, will in 20 years. <laughs> and so just knowing that, you know, just a few months earlier than that, my husband was dead over mm. there. And then just to be like, hey, you know, it's just not working out over there. Let's just get out of here. Right. So that that really was one of the moments where it was like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So track back, you know, you're um, he's getting ready to deploy and he's getting ready to go to combat again. And, you know, your first experience, you're experiencing this as a couple, but you're you're pregnant. Yeah, we had found out I was pregnant on Thanksgiving of 2007 and he had he had just gotten orders to Fort Hood and it was it was pretty random. He had already been and getting And actually, I want to stop you right there real quick. You had had a miscarriage before this. I did. We we found out I was pregnant like 2 days after we got married. Wow. And it was the next day I was at work and I was having some pretty brutal um, abdominal pains and I got rushed to the emergency room and they were like, oh, hey, by the way, you're pregnant and we think that you are having an ectopic pregnancy, which is a pregnancy in your fallopian tubes. We need to take it out right now because you could die. Mm. And so they pretty much took me into surgery and said, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, it wasn't. You just had a cyst and it ruptured. It was really painful but you're probably going to lose the baby. 
Oh, and sure enough, a few days later, I, I had a miscarriage and it was something Jose and I had been talking about for a while. Like we wanted to get married. We wanted to have a baby. It was a big part of it was Jose said, if anything ever happens to me, I want to, I want to make sure that I left a legacy and I want to make sure that that legacy is going to know me. Mm-hmm. And, and so we ended up losing that baby and uh, who knows, maybe a blessing in disguise, but we ended up finding out I was pregnant again with our daughter, Jamie, on on uh, Thanksgiving of 2007. And Jose, like I said, he had already received orders to go to Bragg, I believe, for, I don't even remember anymore. It was like ranger school, something. Mm-hmm. And then he ended up getting new orders to, to go to Fort Hood. And I was like, no, 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 you can't go to Fort Hood because you have like ranger school. Mm-hmm. He was like, honey, that's not how it works. <laughs> um, if I'm going to PCS, this kind of supersedes it. So, and I was like, no, no, they, they don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Wishful thinking on your part. There, probably, there was yeah. a lot of convincing that mm-hmm. I did not know what I was talking about. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so he was like, all right, I, I actually have to report like a week before Thanksgiving. So you stay here. Let's let's try and at least sell the house because we're going to be stationed at P- or we're going to PCS to Fort Hood for a couple of years. There was no word on the deployment yet. And so he packs up his stuff. He heads down there. I I start to like get our house ready for possibly selling it. And October comes around and he goes, hey, honey, I'm going to be deploying. Mm. Okay. Like I had no idea what that felt like. Was I supposed to be scared? Like there was no prior experience for me to ever be able to tie the emotions to. But all I remember was thinking, oh, my God, my husband's going to die. And it wasn't one of those like, oh, he's going to war. He's going to die. It was this deep in my heart feeling of my husband's not going to come home from this and just trying to shove it down and pretty much just chalk it up to you've never been through this before. It's new. Of course, this is where you're going to go with it. People possibly die in war. And so it was just kind of something I tucked away for a while and uh, December comes along and we're still trying to sell our house and they weren't supposed to actually deploy until January and December, a few days before December 15th roll around. And he's like, you need to get to Texas. I'm deploying on Saturday. He said, they moved it up. There's a lot of stuff going on in Missoula right now. And we're leaving on Saturday, get down here. And so I pretty much packed up everything in my truck and a lot of caffeine and barely pregnant and pretty much just drove all night, just understanding i have a limited time with my husband how fast can i get there Mm, wow so after a wrong turn around ohio yes i did not know how to read a map (laughs) and back then that was actually important (laughs) for all you youngsters out there yeah no maps a big fold-out map of the united states It's kind of humorous to think about. So a little wrong turn and then, but you finally get to Texas and it took a little bit, but you got there. 18 hours. 18 hours. Yeah. Should not have taken that. (laughs) Should not have taken that long. (laughs) So you get there and then he's leaving. Yeah, I got there and he, he told me, Hey, we need to set you up with an apartment for right now. So we're going to go get you a studio apartment. It's going to be you and Jamie. And so we found it within the day and that was pretty much it. He he was with his guys trying to get all their gear ready and Saturday morning rolled around and he said, hey, meet me at the gym on post and this is going to be it. But I have to go right now because everybody has to fully get their kits ready. Right. And so I'm just, I'm sitting with my in-laws who drove in and they they speak Spanish. So for me, it was just broken English and broken Spanish trying to communicate with each other, just telling them, hey, it's it's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. And so we get to the gym and Jose's sitting there eating Whataburger, telling me how badass it's going to be once he gets there. And he's really excited. This is what he's pretty much prepared his entire life for to go with these, these guys, especially being older and seasoned NCO. For mm-hmm. him, it was a big deal to be able to go back. And I was sitting there just like, I don't know what this means. <laughs> okay. <There's> Slash no. <laughs> this sucks. <laughs> and so when when they left, they got onto the buses and it was the typical, 
kind of picture that you see from back then, the wives running up to the buses and, mm-hmm. and holding their husband's hand for the last time. And and just Jose was like, all right, this is embarrassing. Can you please step back? <laughs> <laughs> he was definitely an alpha male. Oh, sure, yeah. 100% for yeah. sure. And I was just like, hey, I want you to cry. I want you to show me that you're going to miss me. And it was just like, I'm going to I'm gonna talk to you on the phone in a couple of weeks. Just like, come on. I have to be cool, I have to be, I have to be cool here. Step back. <laughs> See, and, Penny, I've never cried in my life. <laughs> and so, like, yeah, I kind of stepped back. And, and Jose's parents were kind of pulling me back a little bit further. Just like, okay, you're going to be fine. Everybody drives off. Off and we get into my truck and the second and I'm sitting in the back seat my my father-in-law refused to let me sit in the front very male dominant <laughs> yeah. and um so he has me sitting in the back seat and the second the truck turns on if you're reading this from Tim McGraw comes on mm, and of course oh it's a letter or it's Jeez. Tim McGraw saying if you're reading this it's because I'm not coming home but I loved you please tell her daughter that I love her that's and brutal. oh, it was so hard, and I was crying, and I was telling my father-in-law, "Hey, turn turn this off. I I can't hear this right now." And he's like, "Louder!" And he put the, <laughs> he put it on louder, and I was like trying to like throw myself over onto the dash, trying to like turn it off, and he had no idea what was going on. And I was just like, "Okay, like if this isn't any sort of <laughs> message that right element, now, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah." And That's and brutal. so from then on, like the entire deployment, that song was something that was just constantly coming on the radio and i didn't listen to country music until i moved to kentucky yeah and so you have to listen to country you music you have to there, it yeah. you you kind it's of like are, texas you're so. not allowed to live in kentucky if you don't listen Let's to country the because state. there's nothing else on the radio <laughs> yeah true. even the rap was country <laughs> 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 nelly country grammar isn't that nelly i don't know i just made that up um but you know that's important because you know what you're talking about there because you know that th- that moment you know you had so many like kind of you, whatever you want to call it you know whatever you are you know obviously i'm christian i believe in you know i believe in sense of that you know feeling certain things out yeah and having and, bad feelings and, and that happened throughout the entire deployment and it yeah. was just like no it's just a new experience mm-hmm. to where you don't understand what this feeling is and it's kind of like how everybody says trust your gut trust your instinct but you know what if you're feeling like your husband's gonna die don't trust that instinct <laughs> yeah don't yeah, that's but at the same time, I mean, you know, it's it's hard to kick that, right? Oh, right. Oh, especially during that time whenever anything happened in Iraq, it was all over the news. So if I was at work, I would see something flash across the screen and I would have to step out and see what it is that they were talking about. You know, there was an IED explosion in Mosul and it it just happens so often that you kind of don't know how to feel about it anymore because it's like oh well at least it wasn't my husband and you kind of get into that habit of at least it wasn't my husband oh i'm gonna hear from him probably in the next couple of days and then that kind of guilt was going on in the beginning Mm. and then afterward which i talked to you about because of my sister just at least it wasn't my husband and me saying i wish it was your husband (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah, i mean that's that's tough yeah there is a sense of guilt that follows you in that um you know in the army you know and marine corps you know when we come back we talk about as survivor's guilt right um and spouses have it too like in in a completely different way but it's it's more of i guess not necessarily survivor's guilt but like oh my god this was our last conversation oh my god we argued oh we talked about something so stupid how come i didn't know this was going to happen to where there was this like meaningful conversation our last conversation was probably the last conversation I ever wished I would have had with him because we planned his funeral. Mm, yeah, gosh. Yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope not. And I hope, you know, for all you listeners who listen, like, you guys are laughing. Like, you know, you hear me laughing, but it is it is something that you grow to live with. Um, you know, it's been 11 years now. Oh, and if you don't laugh about it, it becomes something that's just such a heavy weight on your shoulders that there's plenty of other women that I know that constantly carry that guilt and that pain with them. And it prevents them from fully living their lives to their highest potential because they live with the weight of my husband died instead of my husband died. I have to live 
keeping on his memory. And for me, that's what it is. Like I, I use not only my childhood, but Jose's loss to push me forward to not only be a better mom, but a better wife and just an overall better person. Because I know that life is so short there. There's nothing guaranteeing that I wake up tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be a better person. I'm going to live a really great fulfilled life. Right. Because it's not promised to me tomorrow. Right. Yeah, that's and so, so true. And so I can laugh about it just because if I can't laugh about it, I'm going to cry. And if I cry about it, then you're not going to see me for a couple of days because I'm going to be in my pantry eating. <laughs> 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 Nobody wants to see that. Nobody. <laughs> that's funny. Um, so he deploys and then he's gone overseas and you're pregnant and you're dealing with a whole pregnancy mm -hmm. and at home. And during that time, like think about 2008, the social media we had was MySpace right. and Yahoo Messenger, sometimes AIM. Mm -hmm. And anybody who's listening to it now probably has no idea unless you're in your 30s what any of that is. Right. And so during that time, it was if we talked to each other, it was maybe once every two weeks, sometimes every three weeks, depending on how tough it was out there because i remember there were times where i would hear about what was going on in Mosul, and there were blackouts all the time because men were dying mm -hmm. and so every time somebody would die they had to make sure there was a complete blackout because they couldn't have spouses finding out over the news or social media or email and so they would completely shut down all phone lines all internet until that family member was notified of their spouse's death or their son's death or whatever it was and so if i didn't hear from him for a couple of weeks it was just like oh yeah five guys died and mm. and it was just okay well you're here so now let me let me catch you up on my pregnancy so everybody else's death was it was there and it was very real but it was well i haven't talked to you in three weeks let me let me tell you about what's happening in our life now mm, yeah so when he was in Mosul, did you give you did he give you a sense of the struggle, or did you kind of try to hide hide a lot of that? He he kept his cool pretty well up until April two thousand eight, and that's when one of his best friends, Chad Caldwell, was mm -hmm. killed, and he was killed in an IED. And after the blackout was lifted, he called me crying, and he was just like, "Chad, Chad died," mm -hmm. and for him that was a huge deal. He looked up to Chad like. Like he was this God. It was Chad could do no wrong. And and so for him, that was probably the one and only time I ever heard in his voice how difficult the deployment actually was. Other than that, it was just like, honey, I'm at war. What mm -hmm. do you think it is? Yeah. And then Chad died. And then Chad died. And it was just like, this is real. Yeah. And the rest of this war is not going to be the same. And it, it really was like the first time that it hit home for me too because i had heard so much about him to where it was it, it was this close it was your friend what's keeping it from being you yeah there's a consciousness of mortality in that moment yeah. and i think especially for the guy you know for for jose is so close to home you know you can even lose a guy in your unit and kind of be like well, that was really tough. Yeah. And, but that wasn't like my best friend. But you get somebody that's that close to you and you feel that sense of pressure. You realize, oh my God, that could have been me. Yeah. And in some ways for Jose, I'm sure he would have told you that he wished in that case it had been him. Oh, that was 100% Jose because for him it was, he had two kids to come home to. Mm -hmm. And so why couldn't it be me? And then it was that reminder of, I know you haven't met her yet. I'm still pregnant, but you also have a baby who is going to one day be born and yeah. she would like to meet you and I would like her to meet you. And so it was, but for him, he was very selfless to where it was, I would rather it be me than for it to have been him. And now his kids are going to grow up without him being there. Right. And then he, so he had been over there for how long before he came home on leave? Let's see. So he deployed December 15th and he came home on leave September 11th, 2008. Oh, wow. That's yeah. wild. Jeez. That's crazy. There's all kinds of, there are just all these lines. Yeah. I mean, you could take the story every which way. There's just so many storylines along the whole way. I'm kind of picturing this almost as a web because, you know, every time you tell me something, there's like something new yeah. that pops up. But and it's funny because like you, you only have like the complete top layer of it there's so much that goes into it so when i tell our story i'm like hold on no to get to this you actually have to understand six months before that but to understand mm. that you actually have to go to day one yeah because everything just kind of flows together so perfectly 
to where if you take part of it out, it doesn't really make sense and it leaves people kind of questioning. Right. Well, this podcast is 26 hours long, so <laughs> we're good. <laughs> Did I tell you that? No bathroom breaks. <laughs> um, so, you know, Chad, Chad dies. Um, you know, Jose comes home September 11th. What was it like when he got home for you? I was so nervous and it's something I remember just being like, I don't know why I'm nervous. I've met him before. Mm-hmm. Like we, we have a life together, right? but I'm nervous. I have these butterflies. I felt like I was stumbling over my words. And the funny thing is, is there was uh, the Associated Press who was pretty much like embedded with his, his unit out there and, and they stayed with, with his troop for a while and they covered him. And so they said, hey, you know what? We've covered Jose while he's out there. We saw him get his ultrasounds of Jamie. You know what? We want to be there when he comes home. So we had an Associated Press photographer with us, and they took pictures of him actually coming and meeting Jamie for the first time. And for me, I was just like, oh, my God, like wow. you're you're holding our baby for the first time. And I was nervous. I was so mm. nervous and I was sweating profusely. It was disgusting. <laughs> I was so embarrassed. Yeah. And Jose was just kind of like, keep your cool. Like, <laughs> Calm down. Yeah, it was just like, I know you. What do Got you a camera like, crew here, like, though. Come, yeah, he always yeah. had to be like the cool guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so He's for like, him, it was... This is normal. Yeah. They always follow me around. <laughs> and he was so used to it because they had followed him around for so long to where right. it was just like... Sherry, stop it. You're embarrassing me. <laughs> and it's amazing. And so we finally kind of get to the car and he's catching me up on, on everything and he's awkwardly trying to hold Jamie. And I just remember looking in awe at him like, oh my God, that is my husband. I'm so hot. I, I, <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> and just like, oh my God, that's my husband. That is my baby. Like this is my world right here. Yeah, yeah. And so we spent the next 18 days doing everything. We went around El Sereno where he showed me where he grew up and telling me just stories that I had never heard before. And he was unusually nostalgic during that time. He was. And that wasn't typically Jose. He was just like this macho guy who didn't want to share memories because then it caused him to get emotional. And that was not Jose for him to drive me around and be like, this is where my Nana lived. And we had a basketball court over here and we'd go eat over here. And he would take me to the restaurants that they ate at when he was a kid. And Mm. so it was, it was not like Jose to do it. So as we were driving, I was like, oh my God, I have my camera here. I can record all of this. Mm -hmm. And so I was recording us at Target, us driving through the streets of El Sereno and, I don't have a lot of photos or videos just over the years they got lost or the CDs that they were on got damaged and scratched. So I I lost a lot of them. And, but these videos ended up making it through. And I remember just looking back and being like, whatever possessed him to be like, let me tell you the story about my life. Yeah. Like I am so grateful that he did that because I, there was stories that I never knew. Mm. And so we spent a lot of, time together a lot of money that i was upset about because he bought like a really stupid car that he decided he wanted to fix up and it was a waste of money (laughs) and i was like you just spent ten thousand dollars in 18 days and he said well you know what what's eight or what's ten thousand dollars when you know something could happen to me are you really going to care about this money if i died like Mm -hmm. ha 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 but we have a college to one day think about (laughs) (laughs) you're like yes i will actually (laughs) and so i i was i was genuinely worried about it we were he was an e5 we weren't making a lot of money we lived 40 minutes from base and we both drove redneck trucks that took a ridiculous amount of gas. Yeah. And so for me, it was financially completely irresponsible for, you know, a 21 and 23 year old to be blowing that kind of money that we didn't really have. And on the 18th day, he was like, Hey, you know what? It's time for me to go. I don't want you to see me off. Just stay in the car with my mom and Jamie. I'm going to go off. I'll see you later. Mm -hmm. And so he waved to me and he was like, all right, see you later alligator and walked off. And that was it. Mm, and wow. and I remember just driving 
down the the freeway from LAX and the song um, Watching Airplanes from Alan something I don't remember Jackson um, no I don't know he's like I'm just, just I'm just I'm just stars. I'm, he's like I'm just sitting here watching airplanes go by and I remember like watching the airplanes being like one of those airplanes has my husband and it's taking him back to war mm. and I was sobbing and his mom was just like oh it's okay it's okay and like it's not okay. Let's <laughs> <laughs> go back to combat. This is not okay. But the thing is, is like I don't mm-hmm. think she fully understood what it meant mm-hmm. to go to war, right? And because Jose, of course, wouldn't tell her what he was doing out yeah. there, and she she didn't understand it. And so for her, it was just like, no, honey, you're gonna be okay. Don't worry, he's fine. Yeah. And and that that was pretty much it. It was it was relatively quiet from September to October. Yes, there were still guys in his troop that were being killed but it it was quiet Mm. and jamie was already born so so much of my time was occupied with jamie just like oh hey look she's eating a full bottle and like it was my life was jamie and oh hey jose i wrote you a letter but i'm tired i have to go to bed yeah and it, it was it was such a surreal feeling because we knew that the end of the deployment was coming soon. Mm. And we we got to the point finally where it was like, hey, you know what? They're going to be coming home. And also funny story, my sister, her husband was my husband's brother. Mm. And they were both deployed in Iraq at the same time together. Which is wild, yeah. And so we were both living in, in California together with our in-laws in the same bedroom. Yeah. And so her husband was coming home a few months before Jose. And she was like, hey, I've got to move back to Fort Campbell. Do you want to go with me? Mm. And so we figured, well, we've been together this entire time anyway. So I moved back to my house at Fort Knox because it didn't sell. And she moved to Fort Campbell, which is only two hours away from each other. And... So during that time, it was just like preparing for Jose to to get back. We had the nursery set up for Jamie and I got tired of being by myself. And so I moved to Fort Campbell, just Jamie and I left all of our stuff in, in Kentucky and that's it. We, we lived together, two sisters and a baby (laughs) (laughs) in a two bedroom, tiny 900, probably 400 square foot apartment near Fort Campbell. Yeah. Wow. So you're together and um, how long before you got the news? Um, so we, we moved back in September mm-hmm. and October rolled around and it was, like I said, it was slow. It was getting really cold out there. And once November rolled around, uh, Cal- or Kentucky and Tennessee had seen the the strongest snowstorm, heaviest snowstorm that they had had in the longest time. So our electricity was knocked out. And so we had to go to Walmart that morning for candles to Mm. not only use as warmth, but for light in in the apartment. And because again, we had a brand new baby who had to be able to stay warm and there was a lot going on. And so we went to Walmart that morning and I remember it was just a typical morning and we were sitting at a red light and I remember looking at my phone and I sent Jose a a text message because he took his phone out there and I said hey I love you and from that moment there was this feeling like there's no words to even express how I felt at that moment but it was something's not okay something is not okay right now I think something happened to Jose And it was just, Sherry, get out of your own head. He is probably on a mission or like he's not, he can't answer you right now. He is literally in a war zone. And so we get back to our house and during that time, there was an email that was sent out from the FRG that said, hey, look, there's a lot of people out there. They're fishing for service members, social security numbers. If anybody comes by, they're doing false notifications. If you get one of these, they need to verify who they are. Call your FRG, verify it all. And I remember joking saying, oh my God, if somebody actually comes to our door, I'm going to kick their ass. Yeah. Not yeah. not physically possible. Yeah. Not with how, how small I am. <laughs> but you would have tried. <laughs> I I would have. Yeah. And so we're sitting there and just nothing really sat right about that day. 
and the evening comes around and we're watching the bucket list eating ramen because that's all we could afford yeah and usual army lifestyle yeah yeah, and so we're sitting there and i want to say it's like one o'clock in the morning and somebody calls my sister and they say hey uh we need to verify your address um if you're from the military if you are who you are then you should know where i live right and i'm trying to like squeeze in to see what was happening and she's getting really heated and she's like no let me call your your um your office give me this phone number and they give her an actual phone number to the fort campbell um casualty assistance center Mm -hmm. and so she's like sure like there's something wrong Mm -hmm. she says they wouldn't call us if it or if some if one of them died, it wouldn't be a phone call. Right. They'd come to our door. So we figured, okay, maybe there was an injury, nothing bad enough that they would be willing to call us. Right. And so they told us, no, this is this is an actual problem that we have here. We need your address. The one that we have, we can't actually find it. You guys live a little too far. The address isn't coming up on MapQuest. Mm-hmm. And so my sister told them how to get there and maybe forty minutes later, because again it was snowing outside, it was it was freezing out. And so I'm holding Jamie in the kitchen and we get the knock on the door. And Mm -hmm. it is that same hollow sounding knock that you hear in the movies where it's just, you you feel it to your core. And I remember my sister opening the door just a little bit and you hear, are you Miss Regalado? Mm. What was that feeling like? At that time, both of us were Miss Regalado. We were married Mm. to brothers. Yeah. and she was like, well, we're, we're both Regalados. Mm-hmm. I said, Sherry Regalado. Oh, and yeah. I remember my sister just looking over at her shoulder and mm-hmm. she opened the door completely. And that's when I realized what was actually happening. Oh, and so I was like, you know what? You guys need to give me a second. I need to put my baby down. And so they walked over to me and it was the chaplain and this other officer. And there's like details like that I can remember with complete detail that it, it's it's ridiculous that i can remember it just like how shiny their jump boots were and them being so calm and casual as as they read from this folded piece of paper that they had that said you know the secretary of the army regrets to inform me that your husband jose regalado has been killed and that was it i i passed out from there onto the kitchen floor and i came to and they were like okay we have to actually complete what we have to say it's like i don't i don't care what the rest is that you have to say just let tell me that my husband's dead so i can move forward what do i do next he said well it doesn't work like that and he started with the rest of um the speech that they have to give and for me it was just i i don't i don't want the formalities of it just Mm. tell me i don't want a jumble of words that you are told to say just be real with me tell me what happened so we can work through this so they, they told me, yep, we can't give you any details, but your husband's been killed and you're going to have a casualty officer that will be here tomorrow morning around nine o'clock and mm-hmm. he's going to he's gonna tell you what to do next. And I remember calling my mom right away and I wasn't even close with my mom, but everybody has that sense of, you know, your mom is supposed to be that warmth. Right. And for her, it was just like, okay, you're going to be fine. I'm going to leave work right now and we're going to get this. We're going to figure it out. And I remember crawling into my sister's closet and just weeping because at that time it was just, why did it have to be my husband? How yeah. come it, how come it couldn't be your husband? Yeah. They're both out there. I have a baby. And I remember just sitting in there weeping, knowing I don't have a husband coming home in mm-hmm. January and I have to raise a baby by myself. And I, I hardly even knew how to be a, a wife and a mom. And now you're telling me I'm a widow? Mm. Like, what does that even mean? Yeah. And I want to, you know, I want... Anybody that hears this will feel that, you know, they can't possibly know what that sense of pain's like. But every time I hear it, I start to get teary-eyed and you feel chills. Uh, because I, I do take it so seriously. Um, but for those of you that are listening, you're a young mom who has struggled all the way through life. Mom goes to prison. You're with your sister, bouncing around from home to home, trying to find satisfaction in the littlest of things. 
and you marry a man who finally shows you promise, who finally shows you hope, who who finally shows you a sense of that knight in shining armor probably that you kind of dreamt about. And he goes to combat and he's Captain America. He loves his country with the greatest, with the highest regard. And you lose him in combat. And that that sense of pain that you kind of felt much of your life was, you know, hitting again. Right. And it, it kind of goes back to that feeling of being alone. Yeah. And I like I said, I'm I'm overall a very optimistic, outgoing, happy person. Which is amazing because of all the things that you've gone right. through. Like and <laughs> and that was something that I, I knew that I had to be because again, if you are put in these really terrible positions throughout your entire life, you can either choose to move forward and choose happiness or I saw my sisters get pregnant at 14, 15 and, and fall into a life of drugs. And it was just not something I wanted for myself for. So for me, it was just, all right, you can either be sad and depressed all the time, or you know what? You can live a good life. Like this is a choice that we actively make. Mm -hmm. And, and I recognize that from a really young age, that was, that was a choice. How did, what were, what were the days like after that? Uh, I, I honestly don't even remember. I just remember in my head thinking, I can't even afford to fly myself to California. Like, what do I do? And my casualty officer was just like, put it onto a credit card. You're going to get reimbursed. Don't worry about it. Just get there. Yeah. And so we got there and it, it jumped straight into, here's a casualty officer. They're going to take the lead. Don't you worry about it. Like right. they know what to do. And so it, it was the very next day, what kind of casket? Is he going to be cremated? What what funeral home? And for me, I was just like... Decisions I, that a young mother yeah, should never have to Yeah, it was just 21 make, yeah. years old. And you're yeah. telling me I have to pick a, out a casket and a funeral home? Like, that that's not a very typical 21-year-old uh, situation that you're put into. And so for me, it was just like, I don't know, ask my father-in-law. He, yeah. but it's a situation, but it's a situation that our young wives and young moms are experiencing in these combat situations and that so many people don't realize. Yeah, I, I was far from being the first and unfortunately I'm not the last. So I am not the only and uh, sadly there's 18, 19, 20 year old women who are going through that. And so right. for me at 21, it was just like, I, I'm a little bit more seasoned than some of the women <laughs> who have gone through it. And so the first couple of days, it was just letting everybody else take the lead because I had no idea what to do. Yeah. And when it finally came to choices that I had to make, it seriously was, I, I don't know. Mm. Can you make this decision yeah. for me? And my casualty officer was just like, Honey, you have you have to do this. This is something you have to sign off on. This right. is your life right here. Mm -hmm. And you it, don't really want to make those decisions. Though, yeah. Stuff. And it, it honestly didn't really feel real until they said his body is going to be coming back um, yeah. on this day. And we, we need to go to the airport. And so I remember like actually getting to the airport and his small charter plane came in and they lowered his casket. And I just remember one thinking, thank God my husband's finally home. Like mm -hmm. it's not the homecoming we wanted, but like he is home. He is on American soil, but also my husband's not coming home. He's home, but he is not coming home. Yeah. And Your daughter's not going to know her father. Yeah. And, and just knowing that the only memories that she's ever going to have, are my memories yeah. and memories that people are going to share with her and you know the small handful of pictures so it's it was so surreal there there's no way to really put words to what it feels like yeah to have your husband under a flag that he fought so hard for you know one of the most impactful moments for me when i was spending this time with you last time i was out here you know telling your story for the caregiver project was we're sitting there and we we're going through that you know the chest of you know his his items and mm -hmm. I, I tell people this all the time but the chills i got when i'm going through that stuff and then you know we see the picture of a young jamie right and there is a hole in the top left corner yeah. of the photo. And that image is where Jose was shot. 
And yeah. he was killed by uh, by an Iraqi policeman, right? Uh, a po- he was Iraqi, Iraqi army. Army. army yeah. And throughout my entire pregnancy, I would send Jose pictures of my ultrasounds and he carried it with him every single day. And so in the upper pocket on his shoulder, he carried a picture of Jamie mm-hmm. at the age that she was when he was killed along with her ultrasound. Mm. And just just so happened that the angle that he was standing at, the bullet went through that shoulder and it pierced right through two photos. One of them was the ultrasound and the other one was a picture of Jamie. And that's one of those things where Jamie has seen it. She's She's been looking in that box since she was you know, old enough to crawl to it to say that she wanted to look in it. And she would ask me what that hole was. And I'd have to tell her, well, you know, it's, it's just an old picture because there's no way at this age that she can completely grasp what that even means. So, right. And I remember when I saw that image, though, like I I held it together. Okay. There's probably some moments where, you know, I shed a few tears, (laughs) But, you know, throughout just knowing your story, you know, for the past couple of years, but seeing that image and holding that gave me a real sense of connection to the moment. And that, I mean, that sent me over the edge. I mean, you remember, you yeah. know, like yeah, that, you know, that was hard. You know, and, and I can't imagine what that felt like for you. What really gets me is like Jose was this hard charging strong man in my eyes and so for me it was kind of knowing that it was one bullet that took him down and I have I have the physical evidence of this one bullet that took down like my knight in shining armor right right well-placed bullet unfortunately and that pain you know continued to live and, and and obviously there's you know that's the importance of this is that never goes away you know people see you know, hear about a soldier dying on the news, they see it, and then, you know, they move on probably like a day later. And yeah. It's like, oh, that was really sad. The family, you still are living with that. You've still shed tears. I've seen you shed tears right there, you know, and you were very strong, but I've seen you shed those tears. And it's 11 years later. Exactly. And that's the thing is like, there's there's good days, there's bad days, there's days where... Like on Jose's birthday recently, I didn't even recognize that it was his birthday, but like my heart just felt heavy. There was something that I like, felt like it was looming. And I was like, oh my God, I'm supposed to be celebrating his life right now. And I'm yeah. over here like at Target. <laughs> yeah. And and so it there's more good days than not. Like there's times where I still cry. There's songs that I still get incredibly emotional about. And it's 11 years later. So there's no way that you can ever tell somebody like it's been 10 years, it's been 20 years for me. I can, I can go back to that day and I can remember what I was wearing. I can remember the smells of that day. I can remember the exact part of the movie that Mm -hmm. we had to pause it at because yes, time goes by and sometimes some of those details fade, but those emotions, they don't go away. They, I can feel it as if it was yesterday and it's been almost 11 years. Mm, Yeah. So, you know, days after that, you know, turn into weeks and months and Jamie grows up and, you know, you're going through other relationships and, you know, you have a son, you know, how did you carry on as a mother through that time? I mean, how did you make it? Because, you know, everybody, you know, there are single moms out there everywhere and it happens, but not in that context is very rare. Like, yeah. How did you, you know, because you had gone from a young girl, like being mistreated, bounced around from home to home, having no good example of like real mothering. And then you have to become that good mom that takes it, which you are now. But how did you develop that, you know, since? I I grew up and I told myself that I when I have kids, I want to have kids mm-hmm. to completely change my outlook on what a family is because I knew that what I grew up with was not normal. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I said, I'm going to change the script. It doesn't have to end with me possibly moving on in life and just continuing the cycle. I said, I'm going to have kids and I'm going to break that cycle. This is not how, how it has to continue. And so mm-hmm. for me, it was... I'm going to use these experiences and I'm going to completely change it because if you continuously put that out into the world, that cycle doesn't end. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's, and that's something that happens so often. I mean, I would say, you know, 
I obviously don't even want to list a percentage, but so often people get sucked back into that cycle. Right. And and it's easy to. It's it's hard to be someone that you did not grow up seeing. My yeah. mom, I, I didn't see a healthy relationship with her. I didn't. And I'll be 100% completely honest. My mom did not have healthy relationships. She was a side piece for married men for years. And so for me, that's what I saw as normal, but mm. knowing it wasn't normal. Right. And so when Jose died, it just, I wanted that sense of comfort again, love, just belonging part of a family again to where I very quickly jumped into another relationship that was not good for me. Mm -hmm. There were red flags in my face nonstop, yeah. but it was kind of like, no, 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 no. But we'll deal with those red flags later. Right. I just want to feel loved and just part of something normal again to where I accepted things that I told myself I would never accept because I saw my mom go through it. And so I, I was in my own abusive relationship physically, emotionally, verbally. It was all there. And I would tell myself, well, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. And then it didn't. Mm. And then he took our life insurance policy. And then it was just, oh, God. Which Jose had earned. Yeah. Ho yeah. Ho Jose earned that with his life. Like that was not just a lot of people like to think that we got lucky. Like we hit the lotto. And that's that's brutal for me to hear people say you got lucky oh, i'm geez. sorry i'd rather have my husband and be poor than yeah, you know that's disgusting sad, anybody like, that says that needs to be punched in the it, face it's unfortunate you can't throat. you can't even buy a, a home you know yeah. outright in california for what we got it's i'm very appreciative for it and but you deserve that in the world let me just say that i know you won't you know hold it that way but you deserve that in the world for your husband's life so to even you know, for i would love to meet the person that says that because i would throw them through that window that we're looking at right now. <laughs> i can give you their address okay sweet i'm headed over there now <laughs> all right bye guys it's been a great podcast <laughs> but again like uh it was just such a tough time that i was not thinking about what i needed to be healthy, I was just thinking about what I needed in that moment where I was accepting any relationship to anybody who said, hey, I'll take care of you. Yeah. I'll take care of you for the price of your husband's life insurance policy, but you know, we'll talk about that later. Oh, yeah. And so finally I did. I woke up one day and said, I don't, I don't actually have to do this. You live in my home. Yeah. <laughs> you are driving my car. I think you need to leave. And that was com when I completely saw that I was in charge of my own life and I didn't need somebody to define me. I didn't have to be just a widow. I was a widow, but you know what? I'm also a mom. I am a friend. I am a sister. Yeah. And I don't need you in this terrible relationship to define me. Right. Because for him, he was he was embarrassed that I was a widow. And oh, I, I wasn't allowed to have pictures up and my flag case was something that was something to be embarrassed about. And for me, it was just... My husband died for that mm, and yeah. I am proud to be that widow. And if you're going to be embarrassed of that, then you need to get out of my house. And it really was just like this, I am a woman, hear me roar, get the <laughs> hell out of my house. Beyonce <laughs> song, yes, yeah. exactly. And yeah. it, it took a lot of life experiences that I had to live through. I recreated part of that with, you know, being in an unhealthy relationship. But all of that really, when I look back, it's just, would I change it? I wish I could. But realistically, it made me the person that I am today where I, I am hard charging while also being very sweet and laid back. Yeah. It, it gave me so much more of a, a variety of creating who I am than mm -hmm. just you know, this docile person that I that I actually was in that really terrible relationship to where I am not willing to put up with this. And now, yes, I am very happily married and again, and it's just, I will never let somebody tell me my husband's sacrifice was nothing. My mm -hmm. And my husband now, he, he fully accepts it and understands it. And he understands that it's an honor for me to say that, you know what, I'm remarried, but I'm also an incredibly proud widow as well. Mm. It, it's no longer like a stigma. It's no longer this red letter on my chest that I need to be embarrassed about. It's like, no, I am a widow of an incredibly brave man. Yeah. I mean, I, I felt that from the sense 
when I first got to know you. And I mean, I tell our story to people who don't yeah. even want to hear our story. <laughs> like, hi, yeah. we're flying to Chicago. Mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you my life story so I can tell you about my husband. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but Jose would be so proud of that. And then they yeah. end up crying. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. I mean, that's kind of a, if you don't cry, then you are a RoboCop. Like, <laughs> I don't, I can't understand how you would have any other reaction. You had the AP film crew with you when you, and you, you know, found out, um, or they were around. Oh yeah. And it's funny cause like, I'm actually still really good friends with one of them and yeah, the photographer, the videographer. Yeah. Or, Evan he Bucci. started following me. Yeah, yeah. 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 And he, he did like a mini documentary on us called 55 days on Vimeo. I know. You anybody, can see it. It's yeah, incredible. Please check that out. <laughs> oh my gosh. I cried like I was watching, I mean, the saddest film of all time. Tim, and- I watch it, I quote it and I still cry and it is me <laughs> Quoting myself. <laughs> You're quoting yourself. <laughs> I watched it the first time and I was like looking around my shoulder. And I was like, I don't know why I care. People know I cry. I was like sitting there and like my I like had my knees pulled up and I'm like eating ice cream and like ah! you know, like it is so powerful. Um, and so well done. And man, shout out to those guys on the crew who did that. I mean, shout out to you for allowing them to do that. Because, I mean, some people are like, oh, dude, there's no way I would be able to talk about that after. I oh, mean, and like there's the, so many powerful scenes, too. The thing is, is like people don't know what it's like to be a widow. And so much of it is like we hear about the men and the women who are killed overseas. But you don't see what happens when those flags stop waving. You have right. everybody who's so gung-ho military. But, you know, once those names cross the screen of like so-and-so was killed, mm-hmm. you see it really quick. And then that's it. Yeah. And after that, you, you don't know what happens once that name scrolls off and and the publicity of it's gone. But girl, you're supposed to get out, get over it right away after. That's Ex- what exactly. Yeah, just you, get over it. And so, but then it's like, no. Uh, after that name crosses that screen, we're still back here. We're we're still here. We are still missing our loved ones, and we are we're planning funerals. Yeah. We're, and and not only that, but forever. Yeah. It, and Jamie will live with that forever. Your daughter. Yeah, and yeah. she looks exactly like Jose, oh and my gosh, and she'll she'll image. she'll tell people like I look like my dad because people <sighs> tell her oh, like you don't look like your mom. She's like, nope, I look like my dad. And she is so (laughs) proud of it. Like she does. She looks exactly like him. I will confirm that. (laughs) (laughs) And so it's, it's pretty incredible seeing just how proud she is without even knowing who he was, but just like, my dad died for our country. And she'll, she tells, she's been telling people since she was two, sometimes she did it for the shock and awe. Mm -hmm. We had somebody come over to our house and she said, my dad's dead, 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 dead in Iraq. And I was like, honey, honey, that scares people. (laughs) (laughs) This is not, this is not life for other people. So this is not normal to other people. Let's just tone it down just a little bit. (laughs) I'm not trying to dull your spirit, but you know, honey, this scares people. (laughs) It scares me. (laughs) (laughs) standing across from him like, is that my daughter <laughs> well and so i yeah. i've told you there was a time when jamie was three two three years old and she used to tell me mommy there's a man that stands in my room and he he plays with my hair when i go to sleep mm. oh, and oh you know as a parent i ran into my daughter's room gun in hand looking for this man who's playing with my daughter's hair mm. turns out there's absolutely nobody there and she she grew up just mommy the man was back in my room and again running to her room and mm-hmm. as she got older it was like Mommy, this looks like the man looks like my daddy Jose, and it was just like Jose. Can you not scare me? Because this, I, I, I love you. Can you just like do can the? Can you ti- do this in a cool way? Do like the typical yeah. sign, like oh, there's a feather on my shoulder, <laughs> not <laughs> halo around my head, a butterfly, not something the normal. At with my <laughs> yeah, that's. I mean, wow, that's incredible. Um, you know, Sherry, I, I, you know, obviously have so much respect. Uh, for where you've come from, you know, and I didn't know you as that young mother, but I've just seen, you know, your growth, even in the past couple of years of seeing, you know, you be getting married and, you know, to another guy in the army, sucker. Um, <laughs> we are oh, and it, crazy. It's, it's so funny too, because like it's. And Nate's an awesome guy. And, it's, say that. and like I have people who, who kind of joke about it. Oh, like you love a man in military and I'm not going to lie. They look amazing. But like, like and, and that's, that's yep. not even it. It's a bonus, but it's not it. Right. It's I, I saw what my potential was as a military spouse just at 19 to where I was just I had told myself that if I did not marry military again, there was a lot of potential that was going to be lost. Mm-hmm. And at first I, I was not 
emotionally ready to be with someone in the military. So I said, okay, well, you know what? Maybe a police officer is pretty similar. They had that the same idea of, you know what? I could get hurt at work today. I am not guaranteed the next day. And there's still that, that love of country and right. just wanting to protect. Mm-hmm. It is not the same. Not yeah. not the same at all. And yeah. so I said, well, I'm not, okay, maybe we'll try the Marine Corps. I dated somebody in the Marine Corps and that will never. They're <laughs> That's crazy. No, she's com- com- complete I'm different. Edit so much of this. <laughs> Co- completely different, and it was just like I my- love you, Marines, but you are you crayon eaters are nuts. <laughs> eaters, you're nuts, but I love you. And but, so, yeah, for me, it was just yeah. like that is not where my heart is. I, right. I I understand the army. I know those acronyms. I you you can you know get me to to do the phonetical alphabet forwards and backwards, mm. and I've got it. <laughs> and uh, which and makes s- you even more awesome. And so for me, it was just, okay, I, if I'm going to date somebody, they don't have to be army, but you know, it's a bonus. And yeah. then I happened to, to be scrolling along on Tinder and I saw this really incredibly good looking man and it was just like, oh, and he's in the army. Oh my God. And he's educated. He's really good looking. And mm-hmm. and so it, it was just... He is good looking. I'll it, confirm it. It was just knowing that my potential as a military spouse was not going to be wasted and i knew if he were to ever deploy you know what i've got this i know what it's like to be a military spouse i know the loss of it to where like small arguments don't mean anything and like you can move over it really quick because you know the last time i talked to jose i had planned his funeral Mm -hmm. and i don't ever want something that shitty to be like my last conversation with my husband so it's like hey you know what we're really mad at each other but I love you. <laughs> and I want to kill you right now. I've got a kitchen knife in my hand, but I love you, baby. <laughs> and it's funny because like, we, we joke about like the life insurance type thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's just a natural and joke, though. Yeah, yeah it, it's just like, okay, I've been through this. I, I can laugh about it now, and I love you, and I hope you don't get into a car crash, but I hope you know I'm mentally spending that life insurance policy right now. <laughs> but I love you, and I hope you come home. <laughs> my sister used to send me messages in Iraq about my dad planning with this guy named Abdul overseas to uh, plotting my death. Um, um, you know, he's going to be along route such and such at this time. <laughs> Plant the ID. Oh, Abdul, you did it the wrong route. You know, like my sister would send me messages like that just to keep my sense of humor yeah. up. So I totally get it. But yeah, that's that's crazy. I mean, you've got to have that sense of humor because if you take it too seriously, I mean, it'll just drive you crazy. Yeah. And and when, when I first met Nate, it was just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a military sp- mm-hmm. or I'm going to be a military spouse. We're just, you know, dating and now we're engaged and... You're, you're just in the National Guard. You're not really going to deploy. Yeah, but then he goes to Afghanistan. And then he goes to <laughs> Afghanistan. And I was just like, oh, my God, this is a real thing. You mean the National Guard actually works and they yeah. deploy? Oh, hey, my I God. Did. Yeah. This is This is a real thing. <laughs> yeah. And so I remember just the deployment. I remember, let's see, he deployed in June and we or July and we got married like a few days before he deployed Mm -hmm. and so you're just a glutton for punishment i i apparently but november 12th rolled around and i remember just this heavy feeling of oh my god my husband died on this day and my husband's in a war zone right now and it was it was like this conflict that again you don't you can't put that into words and so the next day came along and i was like okay okay he made it he's good we're fine and then it, it just dragged on for so long that luckily, like the casualties were very minimal and it wasn't even with anyone that he was deployed with. Right. And so it was just, I was working full time. So I dove into that and my kids are in sports and, you know, those care packages came to mean something special again because it was my love. Like the only way I could send my love to him was care packages. So it's right. just like, all right, I'm proving what a great military spouse I am by one, not only spending all of our, not spending all of our money, but here's care packages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> here's like your 50th package of beef jerky yeah. that you can get on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> hey, things changed a lot from 2008. You're still living in that time zone. Nate was like, Sherry, you sent me a Keurig and it cost $100 to ship. You realize it's free on Amazon. <laughs> I was like, that's not the point. I'm a good wife. I mailed it Tell to you. Tell me I'm a good wife. <laughs> and here's some yeah. Dutch bros. And he's like, again, that could have been sent on Amazon for free. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Sherry... Uh, one thing that I, you know, admire about you time and time again is your your resilience and your happiness through that resilience, your your positive mentality um, that, you know, d- it doesn't come that easily. You've been an incredible friend to me. I mean, sometimes when I bring up, you know, my own personal struggles or something, I'm like, wait a second. 
I'm telling a gold <laughs> star wife this. Bro, your girl problem is really not that big of a deal. My husband died in combat when I was 21. Like, you not being able to get over that girl that you knew for like two months, you, you'll be fine, Tim. Like, you know. I'm sorry someone didn't call you back. Well, you know what? My husband never called me back. Oh my gosh. <laughs> We've gone to full dark, folks. We are at full dark, zero dark 30. We are there now. People hearing that were just like, all the civilians at home were like, oh my God, I'm so horrified. But at the same time, she's laughing, so maybe I can laugh too. Uh, y- yes, please do laugh because we do have dark sense of humor and that's where it belongs. If you don't laugh, you cry. Exactly. And, and I'm not a pretty crier. I can no, promise that. I'm not either. I, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <You saw. laughs> so bad. But, you know, I, I did want to, you know, before we close up, I, I really did want to say that, um, you know, one of the things that, it's so rare to me in seeing that passion. Not very many people lose that loved one um, in that circumstance and then go, I want to be a military wife again. I mean, some would consider that being a glutton for punishment, but I see that as the mark of an incredible woman. I mean, I tell people, I tell my friend Michelle this all the time. Um, Michelle ba- Black, who's another incredible woman who lost her husband in Niger, you know, in that horrifying video that went out. Um, you know, I talk to Michelle very often. She's an amazing woman and just somebody that I'll be proud to have on the podcast as part of the caregiver project soon. But, you know, I talked to her about that. It's like, don't ever be ashamed. I said, uh, listen, I find you 10, I find you like, you know, 50, 60% more beautiful because of what you went through, because of you enduring that sacrifice, because of you maintaining the strength through that you, you know some of the gold star wives i've talked to about since a shame because like guys have made them feel bad for that or you know and some guys are just not meant to be married to a gold star wife and they shouldn't be right but for me like i'd be like girl put shrines up all over the house <laughs> wins his day like yes he is number one priority in this household you know kids make sure you honor your father you know like you know like i think that is one of the most beautiful you are the individual you are you but that makes you more incredible to me is the fact that you were able to endure that come out the other side on top of everything you endured through your childhood come out the other side be an amazing mother be a wife again to a soldier again you're crazy for that but it's cool (laughs) hey i love it because i was army so and coming out the other side and then saying you know what I, I'm happy to be uh, the soldier's wife. Like, I'm proud of that. Like, I, I bear that as a scar, but it's a beautiful scar. It's a scar that you never want to bear. But for me, like, I look at that as beautiful, as an incredible mark that, unfortunately, some have to take in this country. Is to In order to form that blood wall that we have that preserves that freedom, I use that term blood wall all the time because I think it's that graphic image that gets it across and maintain that freedom that we have. We have to have men die in combat. And so somebody's going to bear the brunt of that. You bore the brunt of that yeah, at it, a very young age. And it took me a long while to actually be able to say that as well. Like yeah. somebody has to die in war. That is that is war. It wouldn't mm-hmm. be war without it. And if it had to be my husband, then he was proud to take on that title right. as being a soldier who was killed overseas. That's that That for him was what he lived for and it's what he died for. And so for me, I'm incredibly proud to be able to carry on that memory and, and the legacy to be able to tell people, you know what, my husband died for your freedom. You're welcome. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, hey, Janice, have a better attitude when you cut me off. By the way, the reason you had the freedom to be a real jerk like that was because my husband died for our freedom. <laughs> you're welcome. I mean, you're welcome. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, in closing, Sherry, I just wanted to ask you if you had any, you know, I think that there are profound bits of advice that we can give here. Um, This is a learning experience for a lot of people, uh, whether through the Caregiver Project or the Veterans Project or this podcast, uh, I believe it's going to be a learning experience. So, you know, you can provide a profound bit of, you know, knowledge and wisdom what would you tell a gold star wife who is just enduring that, who's now going through this, you know, you know, like I said with Michelle, you know, she, it hasn't been very long. What would you tell a Michelle or someone like that who'd gone through that and how to, you know, come out of the other side? I know everybody's story is unique. Well, there, there's two things. And one of them is always, you have to hold true to yourself. Like 
you need to be proud of your husband's sacrifice or your wife's sacrifice. And it, it's not something that's easy. It's it's a really tough road. It mm-hmm. gets, it's hard to say it in the beginning. You, you can't tell somebody it's going to get easier because that that's not something that's there. But it, it gets better. There's a day where you wake up and you, you smile and, and you don't feel guilty about smiling. And that's okay. It is okay to wake up and feel happy. Yeah. I have pictures of me the day of Jose's funeral and I was laughing and I was smiling because, you know, I was thankful to be alive. I was thankful to be alive to share Jose's memory. And, but the biggest thing to say is people are going to judge you no matter what you do. If you're laughing and you are smiling, guess what? People are going to say, did she even love her husband? That was what people said to me. Mm. Did do you even miss him? Do you love him? You seem awfully happy. Mm. So, but then if I cried, it was, Honey, Other people honey, that deserve to be punched in the throat. Well. Yeah, and then if I was crying, it was, honey, don't worry, you're going to meet somebody, you're going to be happy again one day, and so you are, you're you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. So right. it's really just remaining true to yourself. If if you want to smile, smile. If you want to cry, cry it out. Like it, it's just whatever is going to get you through that day. Right, is what you have to do. People are going to hate you. People are going to love you, and there those opinions are going to change over time. But nobody knows how to how to act or what to say around a widow it's hard enough being a widow even 11 years later but those those first couple of days weeks months you don't even know who you are don't give a f- what other people think about you yeah i that that's what i wish people would have recognized that i i i'm barely getting through my day yeah and having somebody judge me on how i choose to get through that is is so much harder knowing that my husband's not coming home and now there's people judging on how I react to him not coming home. Like this isn't something they give you a, a book on like, hey, when your spouse dies, this is what you're going to do. This is how you're going to feel. It's just we're all so different in how we react to death, especially of our spouse. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> to where it, it really is just do your thing yeah. and be very cautious about who you first date. Yeah. <laughs> I, I say that with my eyes very big, yes. waving red flags. Yes. It's usually, and I will say usually because I know a lot of military widows who have been through this, it is usually not a good thing. Give yourself time, experience just your own life as a widow. You don't need to jump into another relationship to fill that void because it's a void that will never be filled. Right. My husband now, it's it's not that I he fills a void. He... He's a completely separate part of my heart. Like right. he, he is my husband, and I love him. But you know what? I will always love Jose. There's, there's nothing, no new relationship that will ever fill that. Yeah. So just, just, in, it, take it day by day. Yeah. Let people judge you and just kind of wipe it off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they have no idea what it's like. They don't. They don't. And um, you know. And share uh, your story. And share your share story. that story. It is yeah. worth sharing it. Like tell it to people who are going to listen, even if they don't want to listen. Yeah. I'm telling you, I tell people who don't care yeah. and I still tell it. Mm-hmm. There's stories that need to be told because people don't get it. Yeah, they don't. And that's part of what this podcast is built upon is the, the fact in the caregiver project and the veterans project, it's all bridge building tool uh, to help civilians better understand not only that, but veterans and caregivers alike understand and be better informed and improve the community and grow and help each other out because there will be new gold star wives. There will be new veterans killed, yeah. you know, in a- soldiers, Marines killed in action, um, special operations guys. So Sherry, I just wanted to thank you so much for coming on and in closing, I just wanted to say that, um, it's been an honor to be your friend, and, um, I'm very thankful for Jose's sacrifice. I wish he could still be here, but through your storytelling, um, his legacy lives on. And I'm very proud, you know, that we get to share that in this format, you know, not only through the caregiver project, but through this. And I might keep bringing this up and I feel cocky even saying it because they're my projects, but they're, but they're, that's not, it's not about me. It's about them. It's about you. It's about the people who've served overseas who have lost their lives in action. So to be able to like share his story for me gives me chills because I'm able to have like, we are able to have an impact in the community this many years later and let people know a whole new crowd know who Jose is. Yeah. So for me, I just want to say that I'm proud to be your friend. I'm very proud to know you. I love you to death. 
and you're just an amazing human being. And I wish I want more people to know you, you know, <laughs> even though I don't want them to steal more from Because <laughs> she's my friend. <laughs> Anybody, <laughs> you cannot be her friend too. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I just, I, uh, you know, your kids too are awesome and your husband's awesome. And, I, you know, it's just such a powerful story. It needs to be shared. So thank you so much for coming on. I think this will have to be a two-parter because this was really long. And that's great. I love it. Um, so thank you so much for being on. Well, thank you for having me. I, it's really important for other widows to know that they are not the only ones going through it. Mm -hmm. I wish I, I would have known more about that too. So thank you so much for coming on again. And, um, you know, don't forget our legacies are the mission. This has been the Veterans Project Podcast with our founder, Tim K. Check us out at www.thevetsproject.com, on Instagram at The Veterans Project, Facebook The Veterans Project, and Twitter at Project underscore Veteran. Thanks for listening, and don't forget, our legacies are the mission. <laughs>